Broadcasting from Manhattan Beach and the World Wide Web, you're listening to CHSR, HealthyLife.net. As a service to our listeners, this program is for general information and entertainment purposes only. CHSR HealthyLife.net does not recommend, endorse, or object to the views, products, or topics expressed or discussed by show hosts or their guests. We suggest you always consult with your own personal, medical, financial, or legal advisor. in all things and beauty. Welcome to Radio AMB, designed for those who want to live a long and vibrant life. I'm Patty Smucker, your host, and someone who's been in the beauty business for about 40 years. Radio AMB stands for American Made Beauty, and we tell the secrets behind the making of health and beauty products. Our program sponsor today is Free Your Main. That's Free Your Main, spelled M-A-N-E, and you can find them on the Internet. You can also find them at anthropology stores and salons and spas in the United States. Last year, we had the opportunity to sit down with Eden Sassoon, one of the children of the cherished and celebrated hairstylist, Fidel Sassoon, which ironically today is four years since he passed away. Today, we'll continue that story by meeting Eden's brother, Ilan, and you'll learn how Vidal's children have become lightning rods for the beauty industry, bringing together beauty professionals from all over the world to do amazing things. You'll hear how Elon is carrying on his father's legacy in business, in beauty, in architecture, to artfully craft his own, a legacy of his own. During our feature segment today, Elon will share how his pathway into the industry started with cinema and carved a course through owning his own brands and beauty products, salons, working for big international companies, developing architecture, and even alcohol-infused ice cream. This is one of those big stories, so we're going to depart from our normal format and just allow the story to unfold. But before we end today, we'll make sure that uh, we learn a little bit about how Eden and um, Elon together uh, have a new online venture, um, and one's consumer-facing and one, of course, is professional salon industry-facing. So let's get started by letting me tell you a little bit more about Elon. Elon graduated from the American University in 1992, starting a film fund and producing seven films. His films won a Cable Ace Award at the Sundance Film Festival and was nominated at Cannes Film Festival for the Palms D Award. He spent five years in the film industry. Elon found his way back to the family beauty business when he started a skincare company with his mother Beverly, Beverly called Videl Vida. Organics. His first sale was to 3,000 Target stores, and the first order was over a million dollars. Vita Organics had uh, seven million in sales the first year of business. His next success was with LVMH, uh, where he built Klinger Advanced Aesthetics from revenue of 24 million to 46 million in six years. He left the large corporate world and started four of his own salons called Green Tangerine Salon and Spa, two in Connecticut and two in Massachusetts. Elon has grown the business from a startup to $30,000 a week per location. He then went on to build two high-end salons called Miso in New York City on 59th and Park Avenue, weekly uh, revenue of $90,000, and Miso Boston in the Mandarin Oriental Hotel, which is a weekly revenue of $45,000. All six salons are successful today. Alon started Sojourn Hair Care Products in 2009 and sold the company in 2014. He now sits on the board of the Beauty School of America and has launched his latest ventures, which include Buzz Bar, Lookbooker.org, and Salon Matchmaker, uh, matchmaker, Matchmakers.com. Uh, Let's welcome Elon and learn more about it. Elon, I'm thrilled to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. You are Pleasure. a busy man. <laughs> yes, yes. We try to keep very busy these days. Yes, yes. So, so tell us, lead us through the story. Tell us how, um, how did you decide to start in cinema? You know, it was something where you know, I grew up in the, in the uh, beauty industry, and, you know, my father used to take me out of school all the time and take me on trips to visit either the Sassoon salons in Germany, um, of which he opened in 1970, 
um, and there's five there today. And, uh, you know, he would pull me on. I'd go on these trips with him. So I, maybe I took advantage that I was so close to the industry and, and always seemed to be involved, and I wanted to try something different. So when I graduated from college, we put together a film fund, and we just went out there and, and started making films. It, it was uh, something that, that at the time I was, I was very passionate about. And if, if somebody wanted to see one of those films, is, are they? Are, can we look it up? Is there what? What would be the, some of the names? Yeah, so the one of them was called Cafe Society. It was okay. with Peter Gallagher and Laura Flynn Boyle, and that was one that was nominated for the Camera Door and Con. Beautiful film, 1930s period piece. Frank Whaley was in it, and Raymond D. Felita directed it. And I think he just, uh, I just saw his, he did the Madoff television show that just came on. Um, great director. The, he did yeah, the Bernie Madoff show, uh -huh. and uh, so we, uh, yeah, we we uh, we made that film. That was our second film, actually. Okay. Um, our first one was called Homage, and it was written by Mark Medoff, who wrote Children of a Lesser God and okay. City of Joy, Clara's Heart. Beautiful writer, and uh, Ross Marks was the director, and we uh, we got nominated. We were put in the Sundance, mm -hmm. and uh, we lost that year to Brothers McMullen. Oh wow! <laughs> and that was that year, and it was a great film, and that was our first film, and we just. We kept plugging away. We did a show. We did a movie with Faye Dunaway called Love Lies Bleeding with the Village Road Show. Um, we did um, a movie called Brooklyn State of Mind with Danny Aiello and Maria Grazia Cucinotta, the oh, wow. lovely Italian lady from Il Postino. I don't know if anyone saw that. Um, so, yeah, it was... Uh, it was quite a busy seven years. I guess, I guess. And I mean, we're not talking about little films. We're talking about feature films, uh, and you really were able to, to uh, express yourself. Yeah, yeah, we were. And, you know, they, you could find some of them, I guess, on Netflix these days. And we, uh, I mean, I was, I was 20, was I was 24, 25 years old. And I was in walking the red carpet in Con, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm on on top of the world. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it, it it doesn't always turn out the way you want it to, but it was incredibly exciting at the uh, at those those moments. So what what was the transition? What made you what made you transition back into the beauty industry and out of that film? Yeah, I, I realized that I really had a, a passion for for the beauty industry and. You know, it just—I started to miss it. I started missing those, those times, that camaraderie that you share when you go into a salon, or you know, those 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 great moments of actually building a salon into something successful, and and the people. Like, you know, a Saturday in a hair salon is very exciting. You know, it can be like a if it's an exciting salon with great music and the energy is just is booming. It's you know, I, I miss that and. Um, you know, I loved making movies, but there was that long period in between where you had to go out and raise the funds and put everything together. The shooting process, you know, the couple months, that was great. Mm -hmm. The other process wasn't as exciting as as the uh, as the beauty industry. Right, right. And so, when did you actually you actually went to beauty school? I mean, as as the son of Adele Sassoon, did you have to go to beauty school, or did were the the years of experience that you had working and uh, traveling with? Your dad did that. Is that how you got your license? So the um, I never actually got a hair license because I was always behind the scenes. So okay. I didn't I didn't cut hair, um, but I, I started in um, I started I wanted to do something different than just you know work within the family industry. So I actually went and uh, went and went to work for LVMH, which was Louis Vuitton, Moet, Hennessy. Right. And um, we had a, uh, you know, their their model was to build these 10,000 to 13,000 square foot salon, spa, medical centers, and they really wanted someone to come in and run the hair salon um, division of it and build the stylists and and then mark, market people over into the medical side. Yeah, that was really the model. Okay. Um, so we, uh, I came on board. I think you mentioned at the beginning of the show we were doing about 26 million. You know, at the time, and then, you know, we started building these incredible centers. One of them that I built was uh, in North Park Shopping in Dallas, and I can remember it is 
It was the first salon spa medical center connected to a Sephora store. And uh, because we were a salon, we could carry different products than what they carry in a Sephora store. So the, the upsell of hair products was unbelievable in our location. Right. And, uh, and that, was, that was a really exciting venture for me. We had over 900 people working for the business, and I, I ran the operations with a lady named Diane Rosenfeld. And, uh, you know, we, we built quite an extraordinary, you know, entity with, with a lot of great people. And, you know, working with LVMH and the gentleman that, that was uh, um, assigned to, uh, to that account, Rich Rakowski, mm-hmm. um, who ran the division for them, was really, uh, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, thoroughly enjoyed those moments. And what was what stands out in your mind of some of the pieces that great, give you the greatest joy about that time? I, guess, I think it's really the the people that work there. I mean, I, I lived at that time in Miami. We moved from Los Angeles to Miami, and um, we had these very large centers there. We had the Georgia Klinger on Palm Beach Island, mm-hmm. and then we had uh, these vast aesthetic stores, one in Boca, uh, one in uh, Palm Beach Gardens and one in um, West Palm Beach, and they were very large locations. I mean, they did uh, about 125,000 a week in revenue, mm-hmm. which is that's unbelievable for you know for hair salon, spa, medical. Yeah, and what year are we talking? We're talking that was in 2000 and uh, 2002 to about 2000. And, 2001 to 2007. Yeah, somewhere so that's in there. pretty incredible money for that period of time. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and mm-hmm. so these, I mean, these locations, they were always busy and always exciting, and so you know, I, I love that energy and I loved building them. You know, we, we had some, uh, some great moments in the building. I can remember there was one time where the, we were given a certain amount of money to build the Palm Beach uh, location. And uh, LVMH, all, the guys from France were coming over to examine it, and we weren't even close to finish. Mm-hmm. And we were like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? You know. So we actually took all these white sheets, and we hung these beautiful look-like curtains all over the walls. Mm-hmm. And we said, okay, cause, I mean, the place was still in construction. And we put in some furniture, and we dressed it up. And when they showed up, they were like, oh, we love it. It's absolutely beautiful. It's, <laughs> it's a gorgeous location. <laughs> and so there was uh, – and they kept funding. They kept, they kept the funding going. But uh-huh. uh, it was a quick makeshift solution. But very, very exciting. And, and you know, I, I never wanted to leave there. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I really enjoyed working for them. And, and then, um, you know, a, a transition happened. Um, after that, and that transition led you on, led you into starting to open up your own salons. Yeah, so we after that we moved um, up to uh, the Boston area, mm-hmm. and I figured you know all this time working for other people besides the movies, which was myself. But you know after the movies it was the Beverly Sassoon Vita Organics, mm-hmm. and that was a public company that we we made we sold sold selling on the Nasdaq and then. Klinger Advanced Aesthetics, another public company, and I was working for, you know, essentially working for the public and mm-hmm. other people. I said, you know, it's time to, to do my own thing. And um, a gentleman came to me in Miami and said, hey, I want to build this 90,000-square-foot hair school mm-hmm. with dormitories. So 15,000-square-feet school, 45,000 or uh, 75,000 square foot of dormitories. And I said, wow, that's a big project. Mm-hmm. And I was really happy where I was at. So I said, you know what, I think I'm just going to stay where I'm at. He said, no, and we're going to build this gorgeous salon called Mizu, which means mm-hmm. water in Japanese, mm-hmm. in the Mandarin Oriental Hotel. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, you know, I'm interested, but I really like it here. Mm-hmm. And then something forward. happened in my life that really pushed me towards him and, and leaving Miami. My, You know, my wife got... She got ill. She got uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and uh, the best place for to deal with that. One of them is at the Dana Farber in Boston, and uh-huh. she's perfectly fine now. She's she's a survivor and, and a great fighter. Mm-hmm. Um, so I said, you know what? We're, we're that's it. We sold everything in Miami and we moved 
our entire life and and kids and everything up to Boston. And um, we started building these salons. You know, we started, we had the, the four green tangerines um, in amazing locations, salon spas. And then really the showpiece, which was Mizu, New York, and Mizu, Boston at the Mandarin Oriental. Just gorgeous, gorgeous locations where, you know, that really brought out the, the architectural side of me in that location. We had this form glass ceilings and, you know, the lighting was perfect. There were no shadows on the clients' faces and so everybody looked good. And it was, uh, it was really something very special. And, and, and a lot of people, for those of you that didn't hear our first interview with um, Eden last year, you should go back and listen to it because one of the bases of uh, your father's story is this whole passion around architecture and design. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so kind of like a family mantra has always been the, the uh, support of the Bauhaus movement, and that's something that my dad built his, his whole career on was, you know, he always wanted to be an architect. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he uh, he chose hairdressing, but he chose to be almost like the architect of hairdressing. Everything he did was with the geometrical shapes and really following the Bauhaus movement as well, you know, the furniture and the colors and everything that he chose. So it was a big part of the family and uh, and has carried on after that. You know, most people don't know that, you know, he built, uh, you know, many homes um, in between, you know, his, his hair travels and career. You know, he would build these incredibly modern houses, and that's where he would really get to express himself from that, that architectural side. And so, the, and that, that was um, something that you also picked up, and it's as, in between all of the other things that you've done. Um, my understanding, you've also done some homes as well. Yeah, so, you know, I would do, um, I started doing houses and building houses um, with my wife, Adriana, in, uh, in Los Angeles and then in Florida and Miami. Um, and then, you know, but I do like one house every couple years just for fun, uh -huh. you know, really beautiful home and, and, you know, take our time. And it wasn't like, you know, it, we would do very well off of them, but it wasn't, I wouldn't take it away from the hair business side and, and nowadays, though, we're very serious about it. So we, you know, we're in construction now on, on about six houses up here in, in the Boston area, and um, and we take it very seriously now. It's become a, a whole entity on its own, and 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 I love it. I really do love it. You're always in different places, and you know, your days are are, are thoroughly exciting, and uh, and you get to leave something. You know, you're building something very special, and you're. And you're leaving, and it's kind of like, um, you know, like, uh, you know, my dad always felt that that the hair business was, um, you know, the, it was the only organically moving art form, one of them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I think the family's always gravitated to some art form or another, but, you know, putting sound business practices behind uh excitement of the creativity right absolutely well you've mentioned your wife several times in our conversation today tell us a little bit about her and and how she's involved with the with the architecture business the, the building business so she um she went to the uh Beaux Arts school and she's from brazil and she uh you know she's always been designing things mostly for other people and um you know, now now she's full time designing just for us, but you know she's always been into the arts and, and into design, and and uh, you know she, she's got she's got really great taste. So I think things it, it's a nice fit. Right, right. Well, she must. She's married to you, and um, so Elon, and you have a couple of children. I do. I have a daughter who's eleven, and I have a son who's sixteen. Okay, and are they um, are they showing an interest in the kinds of uh, kinds of work that you do as well? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> they show they show my son is all about music. He's a great musician. He uh -huh. plays multiple instruments, and he's all about the music. And uh, he wants to be a, a DJ or okay. produce his own music. And which is good. I had no idea what I wanted to do at sixteen. So he has. 
some kind of a goal of mine. And uh, my daughter's just my baby, mm-hmm. my 11 year old baby. <laughs> it's amazing how fast they grow, though, isn't it? Yeah. It is. And so when you think back on uh, on your dad, I mean, obviously the architecture and, the, and his approach to the art form and that type of thing was a strong influence, but it sounds like a lot of the influence as well was on the business side. How, 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 do, you, how do you feel like is the strong influence your dad had uh, on, on who you are as a businessman today? Well, I think one of the things that he always taught all of us was that you know, surround yourself with the very best people in life and take your ego out of the equation mm-hmm. and you will always be successful. And I think most people find it very difficult to take their ego out of the equation. Mm-hmm. You know, you'll, you'll try to surround yourself with the best people and then, you know, you'll, you'll, taking the ego out is the hardest part. So that, that's always been something that I live by and I know it's something that my sister lives by as well. And how do you how, what do you how do you do that? How do you take your ego out of it? I think it's important to listen, you know, like listen to all the people that you know opinions and some people that know better than you, mm-hmm. and and just you know not all. It's hard to do, but don't always think that you're right. Trust your instincts, but there are, you know, take the good suggestions and 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 don't try to control everything. You know, share some of that responsibility, and then I think the. The energy of whatever you're doing, the project seems to to flow much nicer. Right. All right. Great sound advice. We're gonna uh, we're gonna take a break, and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more uh, with Elon about um, some of the things that he's doing now and uh, some of the things that he sees happening in the future. So don't go away. We'll be right back. here. Here's a secret for a virus-free computer. ESET. They've been a pioneer in the antivirus industry for over 25 years. 25 years of innovative, top-rated antivirus protection. ESET's award-winning security solutions provide a safe online experience for over 100 million home and business computer owners. They are so affordable, fast, and simple to use. So be gone, you blue screen of death. ESET's on my computer. If it's not on yours, visit HealthyLife.net's advertiser page and click on ESET now. Here's the thing about beauty. It's pretty. At AmericanMadeBeauty.com, we're all about the pretty, making it easier for you to find what makes your beauty shine. We have essentially everything you need, and AmericanMadeBeauty.com celebrates brands that were created right here in the U.S. of A. Imagine everything you need from the best hair, skin, and nail products to makeup and even the tools because it's all about pretty at AmericanMadeBeauty.com. We also think you're pretty important, so visit AmericanMadeBeauty.com. Browse, buy, learn. AmericanMadeBeauty.com. We're looking for a few good American beauty manufacturers who want to increase their brand in an exclusive credentialed category. If you're an American company who has conceived, designed, and bottled brands that are all about pretty, then we're pretty sure we're talking about you. And we're pretty sure you should be on AmericanMadeBeauty.com. This beauty website focuses on entrepreneurs and beauty startups as well as established brands. If it's pretty, we want to see it, and we want to sell it on AmericanMadeBeauty.com. To learn how you can be part of AmericanMadeBeauty.com, visit AmericanMadeBeauty.com now. Where positive people and radio unite. HealthyLife.net Welcome back. You're listening to Radio AMB on HealthyLife.net. I'm Patty Smucker. And we're here with Elon Sassoon, entrepreneur and beauty industry mover and shaker. So, Elon, we've talked a little bit about the, the history and um, your journey to this point. You got into the product business along the way. I know you started uh, a skincare brand with your mom early on, and more recently your own hair care brand, uh, Sojourn. Tell us a little bit about that. So, we started a line, it's called Sojourn, and it was. Um, it was very special. I wanted to do something that was very natural and clean and good for the environment. A lot of shampoos that go in our water systems are are, are damaging, and um, so we did a biodegradable uh, line. So you could actually shampoo in the river if you want, take mm-hmm. a bath, and still eat the fish afterwards <laughs> and not worry about anything. So we did this biodegradable line, 
And I had no idea. I think I knew in the back of my head, but I didn't know how hard it would be to actually promote something like this. So we started developing uh, distributors around the country by going to the big hair shows. So we would go to um, Cosmoprof in Vegas, and, and we would rent. We would get a big suite at the Four Seasons. Instead of being on the floor, mm-hmm. we would get a big suite in the Four Seasons and have beautiful displays, and we would invite all the distributors up to to our suite. Um, right. And that's where I met your your good friend Horst Rickenbacker one the first time. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, and so we uh, all the distributors would come up, and you know we started getting tons of distributors, I guess, because of the family name and the quality of the product and the look of the brand. So I think we, we ended up um, putting together about 19 distributors, and which covered most of the whole country. Mm-hmm. And we were really excited about that. And that was the easy part. Then you had to go out. And you had to build each distributor individually right. and, and continue to go there multiple times. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I spent in three years, I went to 2,700 salons around the country. Right. And, you know, I would go in, say, with, uh, you know, meet a distributor in Seattle, Washington. And then for a whole week, they would take me out to visit all these salons in that area. And I would promote one big event that we were having mm-hmm. the following Monday because, you know, all hairdressers are off on Monday usually. Right. So we would you know, spend the week promoting and doing speeches in all these salons, um, myself, and then my whole hair team, creative team, and everybody would come in on the Monday and we'd do this one big giant hair show. Very exciting. And then that's how we'd sign salons up and get distributors rolling and you know, we'd average 20, 25 salons. We'd go into a town and get 25 salons signed up and go to the next town. And I think at our peak, we were at about 950 salons um, for the line mm-hmm. and and before we sold it. Um, but it, it was uh, an incredible journey, and uh, no pun intended. Yeah. And I really, you know, I met so many great hairdressers and creative people, and they're all, you know, so many of them are my friends today, which, which, uh, which I really like. And 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 it was, you know, I would cold call too. I, some of these distributors didn't have the connections to go in a lot of these high-end salons, mm-hmm. and so I would literally just walk in and be like, "Hey, hi, I'm so and so. Can I speak to the owner?" <laughs> and, you know, I, I didn't care. I loved it. You right. know, and, and then when they find out, oh my God, you know, you know. It was it was exciting. I'd right. take them to lunch or dinner, and and a lot of them became my good friends. So it was uh, it was a really great three years. And then we went to we opened up I think Spain and Australia and a few international places, obviously Canada, um, before we before we sold it. And I could tell there's actually a funny story. I was in in um, overseas on one of the trips. I was in London and I got sick. And I couldn't fly to Australia. And mm-hmm. I was like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? There's like a whole week of events where we, i got to be in Australia. Mm-hmm. And so a doctor's like, no, you can't fly. Really bad ear infection. You know, you could hurt yourself. So I called my sister. And I was like, hey, you want to go first class ticket? You want to go to Australia? Can you help promote the, the company? Uh-huh. <laughs> and she jumped all over it. And so she went to Australia for me. But, uh, yeah. That's really? great, and it, but and so why did you why did you get out? I mean, I, you um, seemed like you really enjoyed it. Was there a reason why you decided to get out of it? The reason I got out is because because of my children. To be honest, mm-hmm. you know, I, I I was gone like, we, in the city from Monday to the following Monday, right? And then they, you know, I couldn't even go home for the weekend. They sent me to the next city, right? You know, and uh, and it became. You know, I'd be away for two, three months at a time. Like, I, you know, I might have been on a, like a tour bus in a rock band. Right. And, and it was it was nonstop. And mm-hmm. so I finally said, you know what? Uh, you know, I'm, my home life is, is is very important to me. And, and you know, it, was, it wasn't crumbling, but it was, there was tension. And mm-hmm. I needed to be home with my kids and my wife. And so I told my partner, I said, look, we, we have to sell this business or figure out another way where I don't have to live in hotels every day. Right. And um, we decided to sell it. Well, and it was a beautiful line. I had the opportunity to uh, to try it as well, and, and you really the packaging was great and all that kind of stuff. What do you tell people who are thinking about wanting to create 
something for the beauty industry? What do you think are the elements that, that make for a successful uh, brand today? I think, you know, sometimes you just have something that really clicks, mm -hmm. like a Moroccan oil, mm -hmm. and it's just all the distributors take it, and boom, it just takes off, right? And other times, you really got to work hard, and, and you got to get out there, and you got to build it. You know, like Orbe is a big name now. Mm -hmm. You know, all the guys, Tev and all the guys that started it from Bumble, you know, they, they work it hard. You know, they go out, and, you know, you really got to spend that time going – to all the cities and meeting all the salon owners, especially today. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't just want some rep coming and saying, oh, you got a new line, okay, call me in a month. Right. You know, you got to have to push. and They want to meet the, the owners and the individuals, and why should I bring this into my salon? What are you going to offer me? Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we offered was education. So I had 13 all ex soon artistic directors on our education team, and we made deals with the distributors. Whoever brought the line in, gets personal, private, in-salon cutting classes. Mm -hmm. And that was expensive, but it was amazing. And right. that helped sell it more than anything. They want that education. They don't. It's very hard just to sell another hair care line these days. They want something. And if you offer a salon education, they get very excited. Right. Well, and you're still a salon owner today. So, you know, being on the other side of it as a salon owner, what are some of the things that you're looking for from the brands that are interested in being on your shelves? So, you know, it's funny you say because, you know, when I went out there, it was all about we were the little guy, mm -hmm. and we offered great education, and that's how we could sneak in. Today, you know, most salons just want to carry the stuff that they know is going to sell. Mm -hmm. So even though they claim, well, I don't want, you know, the bigger brands because they're in all the pharmacies and supermarkets, that's what they really do want because people come in and they just take it off the shelf and they don't have to sell it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in, in my salon today, you know, we carry the Kerastase, the Bumble, the, all the Wella products. And, and then, you know, we do have a, a, a few smaller lines, um, but, you know, it's a lot easier to sell the stuff that's going to sell itself, and you know, even though I'm a big fan of some of the smaller lines myself, um, so it's a hard road. It definitely is a is a hard road on, on, in terms of getting people to to pay attention to uh, what's uh, those smaller brands. So uh, it, we, it was fortunate for you because you had that you had that that cachet in terms of your name and and also. More importantly, that real substance to your brand, and that was the strong, strong education that you offered the uh, accounts that carried the brand as well. Right. And and was the education something that you were able to really? I mean, you you pulled from people who had been trained in the Sassoon uh, concepts. So was it easy to sort of bring that team to come together and work together as a team? So first, I brought in Melissa Stone, who was the first female artistic director for Sassoon in the United States. Mm -hmm. She's in Los Angeles, and she's amazing. Mm -hmm. She's one of the best hairdressers. She's a good friend. I mean, a great talent. And so I brought in Melissa, and she assembled this team of all her, you know, friends and acquaintances and people that she worked with and, and taught with at Sassoon. So, you know, it was really, it was really Melissa. i got to give her all the credit for, for really helping to build that team and, and a great team we had. Well, and one of the things that I hear in you that is an echo of your dad and certainly your sister, and that is that, that really getting that ego out of the way, building team and giving people the responsibility to, to carry it off. So um, congratulations on that. We're going to take another break, and when we come back, um, we will continue this conversation with Elon Sassoon. Don't go away. <laughs> the thing about beauty. It's pretty. At AmericanMadeBeauty.com, we're all about the pretty, making it easier for you to find what makes your beauty shine. We have essentially everything you need, and AmericanMadeBeauty.com celebrates brands that were created right here in the U.S. of A. Imagine everything you need from the best hair, skin, and nail products to makeup and even the tools because it's all about pretty at AmericanMadeBeauty.com. We also think you're pretty important, so visit AmericanMadeBeauty.com. Browse, buy, learn. AmericanMadeBeauty.com. 
For all your live or pre-recorded webcasting needs, come to earthchannel.com. Get your web-based message out to a select group or the whole world. It's easy. A pioneer in webcasting, earthchannel.com provides the best products and services to big corporations and government users. And now, this same technology is available to you. They have the best Earthcast encoders, servers, and products to meet your technical needs. But wait, don't want to mess with technical stress? No problem. They'll do it for you. EarthChannel.com is your answer. You can use webcasting for lots of things like advertising, marketing, customer support, training, and don't forget, web radio and TV. In fact, you're listening to a live EarthCast right now. So come to EarthChannel.com. Actualize your audio or video webcasting needs today. You can't beat the friendly service or the price. Call EarthChannel.com at 1-800-849-8978. That's 1-800-849-8978. We're looking for a few good American beauty manufacturers who want to increase their brand in an exclusive credentialed category. If you're an American company who has conceived, designed, and bottled brands that are all about pretty, then we're pretty sure we're talking about you. And we're pretty sure you should be on AmericanMadeBeauty.com. This beauty website focuses on entrepreneurs and beauty startups as well as established brands. If it's pretty, we want to see it, and we want to sell it on AmericanMadeBeauty.com. To learn how you can be part of AmericanMadeBeauty.com, visit AmericanMadeBeauty.com now. Radio your way. HealthyLife.net. Welcome back. You're listening to Radio AMB on HealthyLife.net. I'm your host, Patty Smucker, and we are here with Elan Sassoon, entrepreneur and inspiration behind a couple of new companies. So, uh, Elan, tell us a little bit about um, some of the new ventures that you're working on at this point. So some of them are in the beauty industry, and some of them aren't. And one of them, a friend actually brought to my attention, and said, Elon, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could um, have the first alcohol-infused ice cream bar? So we started a company, and we really started it for the Ultra Music Festival to sell it there. Mm-hmm. And and it was called Buzz Bar. Mm-hmm. It still is called Buzz Bar. And it's alcohol-infused ice cream bars. And we, I wanted to do it very natural, just like the hair care. So right. we did you know, uh, no high fructose corn syrup, you know, very, very natural um, ice cream line. And um, we, uh, we're, it's now in all the Gelson's in California, um, and it's in a lot of supermarkets. So it transitioned from, like, the ultra music festivals into more of the supermarkets. And now the company's going into scoops, so it's not just the bars, and it seems to be doing very well. Um, and that's run out of Los Angeles. A friend of mine, Randy Freeman, runs the business out of, out of Los Angeles. So. And, uh, and so it, uh, is, is Scoops a chain of, uh, like, ice cream stores? No, just to have them in, like, courts, like buckets. Because oh, oh, gotcha. a lot of restaurants wanted to carry it, but they're not going to give you, like, a bar. And, oh, here, try the Buzz Bar. But they will give you something saying, would you like to try our chocolate whiskey ice cream? And then it comes out in Scoops. Oh, got it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so how has it been being in the food business? Yeah, it was it was it was a learning curve for me. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh huh. And again, we brought in some great people who know the food industry a lot better than I do. And so, um, you know, they've they've really been building the business. It's I think we're fourth, third or fourth year of business. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, it looks like it has a nice future. I was yeah. a little worried in the beginning, but. It, it's doing well now. It's doing very well. That's great. And um, and then you have a- another um, venture that you're doing that's consumer facing, um, and that is the uh, is it the Lookbooker? Yeah. So there's two online websites that um, that I'm involved with, and you know with my sister, and we have one's called Lookbooker.org, and um, it, not look hooker. Yes. I always like to clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> I like that disclaimer. <laughs> Lookbooker.org. Lookbooker, and it's um, what it is. It's an online booking site. So there's, and it's only in New York right now. That's our our market and Singapore. When we started in Singapore, these two lovely Australian girls um, put the whole concept together. 
um, Georgia and Renee. And, you know, we now, we're in about 150 salons in Singapore and 140 salons in New York. And the concept is you charge the salon about $100 a month, and uh, they've been averaging about five new clients a month. So the website, which is online booking, directs clients, new clients, over to those salons. And, uh, you know, it, it seems to be working out really well. Also, the site, there's an app, and the site has all kind of beauty columns now, and it's it's really starting to build nicely. And, you know, Georgia and Renee have, have raised a substantial amount of money to to take it to the next level. So they're about to launch it in, uh, in other cities, Washington, D.C., Boston, Los Angeles. So... Uh, We'll see how that goes. And how and how do you feel the uh, how does it differ from other apps that are out there that are already um, booking uh, appointments for clients? So a lot of the apps that are out there now booking appointments for clients, they take a percentage of the of the book. So if someone books a hundred dollar haircut, the you know that app is taking a percentage of that haircut. You know, the lookbooker doesn't do that. The lookbooker just has a set monthly fee, mm -hmm. and then the stylist or the salon gets to keep the, the revenue that's booked off of that. So it's just it's more just the financial uh, the financial end of it. More the financial end of it. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. a little different, you know, in the promotion side with the with the salons. And do you find that um, the 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 beauty industry? Um, is there a difference? I mean, you've, you've been test piloting in Singapore and New York. Is there a difference in terms of the adaption of technology between the New York salons and the Singapore salons? I think uh, I think Singapore is pretty pretty advanced, actually, right. mm -hmm. um, in their their adaption with technology. So I haven't seen much of a difference between the two. Okay. And as you as you begin taking it out across the rest of the country, is that a consideration in terms of how well adapted the average hairdresser and salons are across the U.S.? Yeah, I think one of my main concerns was, you know, is it a first-time user app? You know, mm -hmm. if I fly into Washington, D.C., do I go on Lookbook or say, well, really, I, go, I need a blowout or I need to, you know, have my... I want to get a haircut, and I go online and really find a place, so I'll just book it through the, through this, mm -hmm. um, through Lookbooker. Is it a first-time user? And, you know, we're finding that some of it is first-time, but a lot of times, um, you know, there, there's people who will maybe want to change and look for a new stylist, which is very rare, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but it, is, it happens now and then. Um but, you know, I, I think that's one concern that I have. Is it a first time? Does it happen once or is it repeated? But because there's so many new clients using the app, I, I, I think it's, it's, still working out. it's still working out well. And with this particular app, does the, uh, does the stylist or the salon have an ability to um, communicate their story? So if, if, a, if a client is going on there and looking for, uh, somebody to go to, does the app sort of give them the opportunity to promote themselves? It does, yeah. So they're able to look at the salon, look at the quality, where they came from. They, they can read a little bit about the history of the place and, and, and see reviews, and, and you know, so they know exactly where they're going. So, yeah, it does have a lot of information on there. Right. Okay, great, great. And um, when, where do you think uh, – Technology is going to start interfacing more and more moving forward um, between the relationship between the client and the stylist. Do you see other applications beyond, beyond just booking services? Between the application and the client, you know, I, I, I do. I, I see with our, our own salon, we have a salon here in Newton Center, and it's called Icon. Mm -hmm. So the last salon that I have left because we sold all the other ones. It's... Uh, most of the clients go online and book their own appointments. So I think they're getting a little more savvy, and they're, they're actually, you know, they're going online, they're booking their own appointments. The only thing is that the salon has to have an, some kind of a interface with these apps, like Lookbooker. If you're going to book an appointment with a specific stylist, you have to interface the salon. That makes it a little more complicated. Right, right. So I think you can... you're absolutely right. In fact, I I left my last hairdresser who I used for probably 
10 years and switch to another hairdresser for that reason only because they not only didn't have an ability for me to book online, but they also didn't have an answering machine, so I couldn't even call and leave a message. <laughs> so it's, uh, the times have definitely changed. We're going to take another break, and when we come back for our last segment, um, we will talk with Ilan about his other online uh, offering that he has. So don't go away. We'll be right back. the thing about beauty. It's pretty. At AmericanMadeBeauty.com, we're all about the pretty, making it easier for you to find what makes your beauty shine. We have essentially everything you need, and AmericanMadeBeauty.com celebrates brands that were created right here in the U.S. of A. Imagine everything you need from the best hair, skin, and nail products to makeup and even the tools because it's all about pretty at AmericanMadeBeauty.com. We also think you're pretty important, so visit AmericanMadeBeauty.com. Browse, buy, learn. AmericanMadeBeauty.com. When you're looking for bedding, department store prices can shock you. We'll be shocked no more. Sell steak cheap, not cheap steak. That's the motto of Anna's Linens. Although they don't sell steak, they do sell the best bedding, bath, and home decor items. They strive to provide their merchandise at extreme value to their customers, and they do it. Great everyday prices on everything and military discounts. Plus, if you visit them online, they have clearance items and Internet specials. Visit them online now at HealthyLife.net's advertiser page. We're looking for a few good American beauty manufacturers who want to increase their brand in an exclusive credentialed category. If you're an American company who has conceived, designed, and bottled brands that are all about pretty, then we're pretty sure we're talking about you. And we're pretty sure you should be on AmericanMadeBeauty.com. This beauty website focuses on entrepreneurs and beauty startups as well as established brands. If it's pretty, we want to see it, and we want to sell it on AmericanMadeBeauty.com. To learn how you can be part of American AmericanMadeBeauty.com. Visit AmericanMadeBeauty.com now. Oh, man, it never fails. My suitcase just got ripped apart. Life is a journey. Make it a pleasant one. You Samsonite. You know the name. For almost a century, Samsonite luggage has proved itself to be the worldwide leader in innovative travel solutions. Let it be yours. Visit HealthyLife.net's affiliate Samsonite on our homepage and click to look at the fine luggage from suitcases to golf travel bags. And don't forget, take a look at their travel accessories. Make life a journey, a pleasant one, with Samsonite. HealthyLife.net, where positive overcomes negative. You're listening to Radio AMB, where we share the secrets behind the beauty industry. Remember that our program sponsor is Free Your Maine. That's spelled M-A-N-E, and you can find them online and also at anthropology stores. I'm Patty Smucker, and we've been here today with Elan Sassoon, uh, entrepreneur, beauty industry mover and shaker, and now also an online entrepreneur uh, with uh, uh, lookbooker.org and also uh, salonmatchmakers.com. Tell us a little bit about what that is, Elan. So Salon Matchmakers um, was brought to me by a lovely lady named Michelle Leffler. And, um, you know, the concept, which we've expanded on, was to be able to have um, an online marketplace for jobs is how it started. Mm -hmm. So if people wanted to go to a new salon, you know, how do they find these without looking on Craigslist and mm -hmm. finding, oh, hey, all these listings? But there's no pictures, and you got to research it yourself further. So now you can go to salonmatchmakers.com for a few reasons. One, let's say I want to change salons or, or I'm a student and I want to find a salon that's suitable for me. Well, now I can go online. I could look at all these salons. I could see the owner's philosophy. I could see pictures all this information that really helps me in my choice of where I want to go and where I want to work. And also from the owner's perspective, you know, if we're bringing in quality kids and we want to train them on how to be a great hairdresser, that's a significant amount of time and money invested in, in that person. Mm -hmm. So now on Salon Matchmaker, you can go on there, you could find, say, a, a kid that's about to graduate from the Vidal Sassoon Academy in Santa Monica and say, okay, I'm going through their class. Oh, I really like this kid. Look at his work. There's pictures of his work. He speaks well. He looks good or she. 
and now I want to I want to hire that person. So now I can actively go and recruit someone before they even get out of school, which you know is is hardly ever done. Right. Um, so th- we thought that was a really nice touch too. So it's a free site on the marketplace um, now, and uh, you know a lot of great salons are becoming part of it, and it, it's taking on a life of its own. Mm-hmm. You know? Now there are there have been a couple of other uh, offerings like this. Um, I know Behind the Chair has done something, and there's um, Nuts and Bolts is another company. What do you see as the the big point of difference with um, Matchmakers.com? So yeah, but behind, behind the Chair charges we don't, mm-hmm. um, and so you know Craigslist and Nuts and Bolts, but. The um, you know, ours is a complimentary site, and and just to get the dialogue going within the salon community, um, I think that that was really important to us. Um, also, the um, I think uh, you know we do a little more like the whole recruiting aspect and, and finding talent out there and letting other people find find your salon. Mm-hmm. So salon owners will will advertise on on the site and, and list it and. So we're a little bit different than just placing jobs on a website without pictures and stuff like that. Well, and I do. I love the whole idea that you that you've got it visual, and so a student can actually put up their work and also record record them speaking and, and doing a presentation and that type of thing. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a big difference. I mean, it's just it's very very visual. So um, and so, where do you see? How do you see that this particular business growing? Well, I think, you know, as we get more salons to come on board, Mm -hmm. then, you know, we can try to monetize the site through advertising or things like that. But, you know, as more salons and stylists come on board and and communicate through the site, then then I think it can grow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think the salon industry today is it's a tough industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, out of, you know, maybe... 5% 5% of hair salons make any money. I think it's between 3 and 5%. Very, very tough industry. Mm-hmm. And the reason why even the ones that aren't making money are still staying alive is because you have a stylist operator who's in the salon cutting hair, and, you know, they're taking as much money home as they can, and they're paying the expenses, uh, you know, the overhead of the salon as well. Right. So... That's how you have all lots of salons out there surviving. But if you just looked at it purely on a you know P and L profit and loss level, most of them are, are losing money. So if you're an outside investor wanting to come in and open a salon and you're not a hairdresser, it's not really a good investment. Right. You know, it's it, it's a tough tough industry. You know, with the higher cost of healthcare, the commissions, it's really hard to compete. You know, with other salons out there because everybody wants a high commission. You know, they know their value. And I'm like, well, I want 50%. I want 60%. Well, you know, and they probably, you know, I'm sure they deserve it, but it's very hard as a salon owner to pay that and continue to keep the doors open. Right. So where do you, what do you think the solution is? Where do you think we're going in the future as far as the salon market? You know, I think, you know, you can make a salon successful if you change a little bit to the, you know, the 1099 aspect. So you don't want to lose that team camaraderie where everybody's together on the same team and you do shows and events and things together. But you have to figure out a different way to pay everybody, just a little different than it, than it, than it's been done. I mean, there are 1099 salons out there, but it's almost like people work for themselves and you have that feel. So you, you got to keep it where it's almost like a, where it's not broken apart, where everyone does their own thing, but where you can pay like that, so at least the salon owner has a chance of profiting um, from the business. It's very touchy right now. I think. It is. It's a very touchy time, and I know that you know. I mean, there's a lot of uh, various different uh, uh, laws that are going on and changes that are that are going on, but. Um, I certainly believe that as we move forward, the one thing that's not going to change is the consumer's, the client's interest in, interest in being touched, having a professional work with them, you know, ha- being that trusted authority. So we're really at a at a crossroads in our industry to, to determine what is going to be the model that works for both the 
fair compensation for the staff people, but also making it a business that people are willing to make an investment in. So yeah. that's the, the, the delicate uh, uh, point that we're at. What's, what's the delicate point for you? Where, what, what lies ahead uh, in the next uh, five years for um, you, you and your family? Well, at, I mean, at this point in time, we're, um, we're heavy into the building. So we're building about six projects right now, six different houses, and really excited and beautiful, and restoring this gorgeous old 9,000-square-foot Victorian house. And uh, so we're doing a lot of architectural and fun and design projects. And, um, you know, but one thing that, that I think is next for me on the beauty side is we want to start um, what's called the, um, the, Le the Legends Tour. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring, you know, I already have a commitment from, like, Tim Hartley and Sonia Dove. And I want to bring in these great artists into different cities, kind of like the Lollapalooza of hair. Okay. You know, it should be a hair, a great hair tour mm -hmm. where you have these great artists and you travel from city to city and you do these beautiful hair shows with great music, great models, and lots of excitement. And, you know, I, I don't think that's really happening right now. Yeah, everyone has to go to the hair shows and you go into little rooms and you see presentations, but to have some ex incredible entertainment and then say that's done on a Sunday and then on the Monday – there's, you know, the hands-on where only a select few get to go and really work with these artists. And a tour like that, you know, the the Legends Tour, mm -hmm. I think would be something that I'm really interested in. Well, it's very exciting, and, and I, I think you're right. I mean, the, the uh, heyday of those very beautiful, glamorous shows was done um, at the peak of your dad's career, and, and it hasn't been done in a long time, so that would be very exciting, and to see your uh, your artful handling of that uh, would be uh, very exciting to do. So uh, you've heard it here first, uh, the, the the legend tour uh, of hairdressing uh, with Ilan Sassoon. It's very exciting. Well, uh, Ilan, thank you for being with us today. It's been great getting to know you a little bit better, and um, thanks for the contribution that you've made to the industry in the past, and we're excited to see all those great things you'll be doing in the future. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. Okay, well, that'll do it for us today. Don't miss our program next week when we talk about Peel Away Beauty with Skin Rx and Dr. Neil Stewart. Send us your questions, your comments, to requests at American Made Beauty. I'm Patty Smucker. You can hear Radio A&B on HealthyLife.net. Thank you for listening to Radio A&B, where we think pretty is pretty important in all things in beauty.